Good morning, everyone. My name is Luke Dvorsky, and I have the pleasure of serving as the moderator for our next session. I'm a first year student with the Exercise Physiology PhD program at the University of Central Florida, working under the mentorship of Dr. Colby Mangum. My research interest is in the assessment and evaluation of the lumbopelvic hip complex. I have a few housekeeping reminders. Immediately, immediately following this talk, Delsus is hosting a lunch and learn. Delsus researchers will share some of the latest and greatest in technology and innovative approaches to studying human movement. We are also hosting a raffle at the conclusion of the Delsus Lunch and Learn. We have a $500 in raffle prizes this year. Hang around to see if you won the prize. Also, please remember to join our networking social at 4 p.m. for additional time with speakers in a more intimate setting. Finally, feel free to ask your comments and questions in the chat and we will try to address them at the conclusion of each lecture. Before I introduce our speaker, I wanna thank all of our generous sponsors who made this day possible. Our next session is sponsored by TriPT. Located in Maitland, Florida, TriPT is a leader in providing high quality physical therapy, sports performance, and personal training services. With the goal of having each patient and athlete be your best, TriPT is a place where individuals of all ages and abilities improve their life by utilizing proven methods and resources. The TriPT seeks to develop lasting relationships with everyone that walks through the door. All of us at UCF would like to thank TriPT for their support of our inaugural conference. It is now my honor to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ryan Palmieri Smith. Dr. Palmieri Smith is Associate Professor of Athletic Training, Adjunct Associate Professor of Movement Science and Orthopedic Surgery, and the Director of the Orthopedic Rehabilitation and Biomechanics Laboratory in the School of Kinesiology at the University of Michigan. She also serves as program chair for athletic training. Dr. Palmieri Smith researches the neuromuscular and biomechanical consequences of joint injury with a focus on traumatic knee injury and the develop, development of degenerative joint disease. Dr. Palmieri Smith has published over 80 articles in peer reviewed journals and has received more than 3 million in grant funding. Her work is highly cited in top rehabilitation and biomechanics journals, and she gives lectures all over the world. We wanna thank Dr. Palmieri Smith for joining us. Dr. Palmieri Smith, the mic is yours. Thank you for that great introduction. Can everyone hear me? I hope. Let's see if I can share my screen here. And all right, hopefully we can all see my slides. Um, good morning. I recognize I am the lecture between you and lunch, so I will attempt to stay on time. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Stock and all the faculty and students at the University of Central Florida for inviting me to speak today. Um, and like Luke has mentioned, I am going to talk to you about examining the neuromuscular and biomechanical consequences of ACL injury. And I'm going to finish up with looking at how we can um, really tackle and intervene on those consequences that we see after the injury. So I'm often asked, why do I focus on one injury? Why do I look at anterior cruciate ligament injuries and why, why do I study them? Well, it's clinically important. It's the most commonly injured knee ligament. Um, we see upwards of 300,000 of these annually. They're expensive. They cost the US about $2.78 billion annually. And they affect young kids with the peak age of ACL tears occurring around uh, 16 years old. Why is the, the young age relevant? It's really relevant because about 50% of patients that suffer an ACL tear, whether they have it reconstructed or not, will go on to develop osteoarthritis within 20 years after injury. So we have that 16 year old in their mid thirties, kind of at the height of their life, um, experiencing potentially pain and symptoms associated with osteoarthritis, okay? One in four adults currently has OA, and about 78 million adults, if we stay on the current trajectory, will have OA by 2040. So it's a major problem in the United States. And we see cartilage changes uh, really early after ACL injury and reconstruction. This is some um, heat maps or um, T2, T1 row relaxation maps from uh, a study we did in this, we saw changes in the tibial plateau as early as one year after the reconstruction. So there are many consequences of ACL injury and reconstruction. I don't, I'm not gonna be speaking to all of them today, but some of the things that we see here uh, are decreased physical activity, which leads to changes in body mass, uh, increased body mass, decreased physical function, 
We see changes in muscle strength. Um, we see biomechanical changes after ACL injury and reconstruction. There's a good amount of re-injury and contralateral limb injury um, with ACL patients. And like I've already told you that post-traumatic osteoarthritis is a consequence of ACL injury and reconstruction. Given the title of my talk, I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about these two, these top two, the quadriceps weakness, that's a neuromuscular consequence, and the biomechanical changes. So first I need to convince all of you that quadriceps strength is a, a problem after ACL injury and reconstruction. Um, and then we'll get into how, these, how it's neurally related here in a minute. But if I take a look at the literature from 2008 to 2015, and I, I plot here um, quadriceps strength deficits, Okay. I pulled a number of studies here and I showed the deficits over on the y-axis. Ideally, we don't have any deficits between our ACL reconstructed limb and our uninjured healthy limb in patients. Okay. Dr. Kamari, can I interrupt you, please? I think that you selected your um, side screen, the one that has the preview instead of the, the master slide. So can you stop share and when you re-select your screen, select the opposite one of whatever you selected before? There we go. Oh. Now we're good. But now it's not showing. Are you seeing the entire graph? Hold on. We're seeing the, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing something that's not the whole graph, um, but maybe it's working for you. I know the slide, so it's okay. Um, let me see here. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing like a partial graph, you're not. Okay. We, we are seeing a partial graph on that slide right now. Okay, we'll skip it. We'll go to this slide because for whatever reason, it's showing here just fine. Okay, so what you would have seen in that previous graph is that no subjects or no studies in that, during that time point basically showed any, um, uh, none of the studies had acceptable strength levels in their patients, okay? And you're like, well, that's a long time ago. We've gotten better as rehabilitation professionals by then. So I pulled some um, studies from 2018 to 2021. And again, ideally we would have no deficits between limbs. 10% deficit between limbs is clinically acceptable. And I was gonna say on the, on the previous slide that the 10% number is relevant because there are studies that show that um, if you have a less than a 10% deficit, you're a lot less likely to go ahead and re-tear your ACL graft or your contralateral ACL. So our goal is to at least keep you below a 10% deficit when we return you to activity. There was only one study that I was able to find that sent patients back to sport with acceptable quadriceps strength. Again, showing you that even though we know weakness is a problem and we're targeting it with rehabilitation, it continues to persist uh, throughout most of, the, most of the patients at the time of return to activity. So I wanna illustrate that what we see clinically is really only part of the larger problem that we have with the, the quadriceps uh, weakness that we see. So on the outside, the patients are demonstrating weakness. So when they um, contract, when they contract their muscle, they don't have as much strength. We can also see visible changes in muscle size or atrophy, but underneath the surface, we have factors that are leading to these um, issues that are on the outside. Uh, one being neural inhibition, which I'm gonna focus on a bit today. We also see changes in muscle mechanics like fascicle length and pination angle. There are changes in um, fiber type um, and uh, there's selective atrophy of fiber types. There's changes in the catabolic pathways and cytokines that are expressed as well as changes in myostatin. And all of these factors are leading to the quadriceps weakness and the changes in muscle size or atrophy that we see. I'm going to focus mainly on neural inhibition today because that's what I was asked to speak about, but that does not kind of under, I don't want to underscore the importance of these other factors as well. So what is uh, neurological inhibition? Well, I'm going to tell you neurological inhibition does resolve in quadriceps weakness after ACL reconstruction. It is a problem. Um, neurological inhibition is also known as, or you may have seen it in the literature as something called arthrogenic muscle inhibition or voluntary activation failure. So these terms are used as synonymously, okay? But overall, neurological inhibition is, um, the definition of it would be the inability to fully voluntarily activate the muscle during a contraction. So after ACL injury, we have trauma to the knee Okay. No trauma to the muscle. There's no direct damage to the muscle, but right after ACL injury, soon after we start to see an inability of the muscle to completely contract. Okay. And that inability to completely contract 
is the result of neural inhibition. So I borrowed a graphic from a review that was done in 2010, and I don't want you so much to focus on the arrows, but then to, but to focus on the boxes. So here at the bottom, we have joint damage, and in this case, it's going to be an ACL injury. This ACL injury leads to inflammation within the knee joint. It leads to swelling in the joint or effusion. It leads to looseness or laxity in the joint, and it there's damage to the receptors within the ACL, as well as pressure or changes in the, in the afferents that comes from receptors due to swelling, pain, et cetera. These peripheral um, changes lead to spinal changes. So there's changes in different reflex loops, such as a stretch reflex loop, flexion reflex loop, which alter alpha motor neuron excitability, which basically produces quad, uh, would produce a, a contraction in a muscle, in particular the quadriceps, which we're focused on now for the ACL injury. This decreased motor neuron excitability from the quadriceps leads to neural inhibition or AMI. So we can have spinal changes that lead to this neural inhibition, but there's also data to show that there are supraspinal changes or changes from the brain that affect alpha motor neuron excitability and lead to AMI. So here's kind of just a simple um, graphic. So we have a muscle spindle to kind of demonstrate the pathways with which these come from. So we have a basic stretch, stretch reflex. Um, muscle spindle gets stretched, sends an afferent pathway um, up into the spinal cord, activating the alpha motor neuron, and it leads to contraction in the quadriceps. We can also activate alpha motor neurons in the quadriceps by sending descending signals from the brain um, down through the alpha motor neuron into the muscle. What we see with injury is that we have a change in the afferent signaling, which alters alpha motor neuron excitability. And we also see uh, changes in signaling that comes from the brain um, which alters alpha motor neuron excitability in the pathway to the muscle, which leads to a decrease in force production or quadriceps weakness. So what does this look like clinically or what does neural inhibition look like cl clinically? On the left, you can see that ACL deficient patient is able to make a contraction, but 24 hours later after they have a reconstruction, they're trying to contract that muscle really hard and you can't, you can't see a contraction at all. So how big of a problem is neural inhibition after ACL injury and reconstruction? How much do we have? Okay. I'm going to say that it varies based on the study that you're looking at. Okay. Um, and it also varies based on the time after ACL reconstruction that you are. So generally speaking, you have more neural inhibition early after ACL reconstruction and a less inhibition as you progress throughout rehabilitation to return to play and after. But that's not to say that it's gone away, okay? So usually at the time of return to activity based on the, the existing data in the literature, there's still um, 15 to 25% inhibited in the affected side compared to the contralateral side or just compared to within their own limb, okay? Um, but the magnitude can be affected by the methodology. And I, I would uh, argue that we overestimate the amount of activation or underestimate the amount of inhibition. So most of the literature um, that looks at activation failure or neural inhibition uses something called the central activation ratio. And I don't have time to get into exactly how that's calculated, but it's well known to overestimate activation or underestimate inhibition. And those studies are showing about 15% inhibition. This study comes from our lab and these are the same patients here. And when we use a different technique that's more sensitive, um, we can show at the time of return to activity, actually these people are a little bit further than activity. They're at like one year post-op uh, and have returned to activity. They're about 25% inhibited compared to other studies around the same time that are showing only about 15% inhibition. So neural inhibition, I would argue, is still a substantial problem when these folks are going back to return to activity. Okay? And there's data that suggests this is a problem um, through two years um, post-reconstruction. And it could be longer than that. It just simply hasn't been um, quantified and measured. So where does the neural inhibition come from in ACLR patients? Like I, I showed you on um, some other slides previously is we have supraspinal components and we have spinal components. And ultimately they're affecting um, motor neuron excitability and affecting um, the output at the quadriceps. So I'm not gonna focus on all the reflex pathways that are um, affected because I would never get through everything in my talk if I did that. But I will just focus on the spinal excitability changes that are seen in the literature right now. I will say that there is a good amount of data that shows that there's gamma uh, loop dysfunction, which leads to alpha motor neuron excitability and affects AMI, okay? So if I take a look at the literature and what it tells us is what spinal excitability changes do we have? 
there's a lot of contradicting findings. So I would say overall, there's no conclusive message there. Um, but what we do see is there's some data that early after ACL reconstructions, within the earlier months after ACLR, there's decreases in spinal excitability, which is measured through something called the H to M ratio. Okay, so decreases in spinal excitability, which likely um, is contributing to the decreased output that we see at the quadriceps muscle and in the weakness. However, when we're further out after ACL reconstruction, we're actually seeing increased spinal excitability. Okay? And again, this varies based on what study you're looking at at the time they're they are post ACL reconstruction, but there is some consistency in the literature that shows that there's maybe an increase in spinal excitability later. Well, why do we have these contradicting findings? Why would we have decreased excitability earlier and increased excitability later? I'm not saying I have the answer to that, but I think part of it might be to the factors that are um, leading to this changes in spinal excitability. So early after ACL injury and reconstruction, we have a lot of swelling in the joint. We have a lot of pain in the joint. Okay? And I would argue that the increase in neural inhibition that we see early after ACL injury is the result of this. So we've done some work and uh, Dr. Ingersoll is a part of this work and has done some um, work as well, where we create artificial joint swelling in the knee. So we basically inject 60 cc's of sterile saline into the knee and we create artificial swelling without any pain or any damage to the muscle or any injury to the ligament. And what we see pretty universally through a number of studies is that when we do this, when we stick the swelling inside the joint, that we see a decrease in spinal excitability. We also know that we see a lot of effusion after an ACL injury or an ACL surgery, which is likely also decreasing spinal excitability. We've done something similar with a pain model where we in, uh, inject hypertonic saline into the patellar tendon, and it also decreases spinal excitability. So maybe the peripheral changes that we're seeing early after injury and surgery are leading to a more pronounced uh, change in spinal excitability early after ACL reconstruction and injury. <laughs> so what other um, um, factors do we have um, that are contributing to the neural inhibition? So we took a look at what's going on at the spinal cord, but what's happening at the brain um, level that we see? So there are mixed results again, but I would say relatively consistently, what we do see is an increase in the active motor threshold. Okay? And an increase in the active motor threshold is we, we measure this using transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, indicates that the neurons that are originated in the motor cortex up here in the brain that are responsible for um, a quadriceps contraction have basically higher cell membrane excitability, or, me or it means it's more difficult for individuals to activate those neurons to fully control the muscle. Okay, so it's harder for them to activate neurons that turn on and tell the muscle to contract. Okay, um, the results are mixed with motor evoked potentials. And in part, that's because the studies are done at vastly different periods of time post reconstruction. And my guess is that there's a lot of um, differences in what's going on with the motor evoked potentials um, based on time from um, post reconstruction. Okay, from our lab, we, we have consistently seen in people around the time of uh, return to activity or earlier than that, that we see a decrease in motor evoked potentials. There's some work from other folks that have seen the same thing. And again, we're using MagStim to measure these. Um, and it's the ACL limb um, is lower than the control limb, but this is not a consistent result that we see. So not all studies have shown this, but in our work, we see lower motor evoked potentials. Um, and, and that basically suggests that once an action potential is produced, at the motor cortex, less of the signal will actually reach the muscle, leading to a, a potentially a lower contraction. There's also some work from um, Dr. Adam Lepley that was at the University of Michigan as well, where he sees uh, increased activation in the frontal lobe or basically increased um, blood flow to certain areas of the frontal lobe um, in ACL patients while they're completing a, a very basic flexion extension task inside an MRI scanner. Okay. And the areas that seem to be affected or where this blood area, this blood flow is going it, are uh, important for motor planning and motor coordination, um, suggesting that maybe ACL individuals need to use these areas more in order to do simple contractions or simple um, motor coordination tasks um, than control subjects that don't have an injury. So overall, I would say that while there may be some discrepancy in the literature about the changes in direction, I feel confident in saying that there are neural changes that are happening after ACL injury and reconstruction. And these are occurring alongside changes in muscle weakness and atrophy and are likely contributing to the changes that we have. So when we're thinking as rehabilitation professionals, 
we're not just treating the muscle itself. We kind of need to work on focusing on the brain and spinal cord to get it right too. I, I don't, I didn't want to, I don't want to ignore atrophy because atrophy is really important in the weakness. Um, but I also want to draw everyone's attention that to neural inhibition or the AMI also contributes to atrophy. Okay. So if we are unable to contract our muscle completely, that is going to lead us to muscle atrophy because it's disuse atrophy. We're not using the muscle like we were before. We're using less component parts of the muscle than we were before. So this graphic is pretty simplistic in showing that we have ACL injury. We have immobilization and dysfunction. That immobilization can be in a form of a brace, but AMI is actually thought to be a protective in nature. So the brain tells the brain and spinal cord tells the muscle to shut down, stop moving that joint, stop contracting that muscle. So we avoid unwanted painful motion. Okay. And because of that, this AMI, if persistent and we don't overcome it, is going to lead to atrophy, which leads to muscle weakness, which we know can result in ACL re-injury. And AMI, or this neural inhibition, is at the center of this cycle, which we need to overcome the neural inhibition to restore muscle strength. I often get asked, is, which one should I worry about more, the atrophy that happens or the inhibition? Well, I'm going to tell you, you have to worry about both. I don't think you can get rid of atrophy without getting rid of inhibition. Okay, so uh, the jury's still out though. If we take a look at the literature and is which, if we wait one more than the other, is there one I should focus on? No, you should focus on both. If you look at ACL deficient patients, the data coming out of um, the University of Delaware suggests that uh, atrophy and activation failure or inhibition accounted for 60% of the variance uh, in the MVIC or the, their muscle strength. Um, we have shown that only atrophy matters at return to activity, not only atrophy, but it is, uh, it's a more dominant factor uh, in the peak torque, um, basically accounting for over 30% of the variance in the, the peak torque compared to only 8% uh, activation. Okay. But again, time from ACL reconstruction is really going to affect this. I really suspect that if we longitudinally studied this over time, that neural inhibition would play a larger role earlier after ACL reconstruction, which would then contribute to atrophy that's going to persist um, after ACL reconstruction and maybe become a larger problem at later time points. The other thing that I want to draw folks' attention to, which is kind of an interesting finding, and we're still trying to figure it out, is that the variable used to kind of determine which one may play a larger role in the weakness that we see can be dependent on the measurement that you use. So we recently published a study where we looked at just peak torque from the injured limb and inputted it into a regression. And then we created peak torque limb symmetry indices, which is basically um, computing the injured limb, having the injured limb data divided by the uninjured limb data um, to compare the two, um, which is very commonly done. And then we inputted a voluntary activation failure and cross-sectional area for the peak torque of the injured limb. And then we ran a separate model where we looked at voluntary activation limb symmetry index indexes, as well as cross-sectional area limb symmetry indexes, as well, and then had it predict peak torque limb symmetry index. And we found that when we used LSIs for whatever reason, or these limb symmetry indexes, indices, the voluntary activation failure was a large predictor of peak torque LSIs, 68%. But when we actually only use the injured limb data for whatever reason, and we're still trying to figure it out, cross-sectional area became the, the primary or the dominant factor that predicted torque. Hey, these are the same subjects. Hey, and we were like, this has to be a fluke. It, can't, it has to be the data set. But we've gone back to a bunch of data sets and we've seen a similar result. So when you're looking at the literature, you need to be able to consider those types of things. It could be the variable that's used when the makes a difference in what factor is more relevant in a, in a regression model trying to figure these things out. So what are some other changes that we see in quadriceps neuromuscular function after ACL um, injury and reconstruction? Um, I thought it was important to mention that not only do we see peak torque changes and do we see neural inhibition and atrophy, but we also see changes in the rate of torque development or the speed with which somebody can re, uh, achieve peak torque. Okay, which is being demonstrated over here on, in this figure, which is the ACL limb versus a control limb. And they see deficits upward from like 22 to 55% uh, uh, slower rate of torque development in ACL patients compared to control patients anywhere from about six months to two years after ACL reconstruction. And these are thought to be at least in part neurally related because of uh, reduction in firing rate of motor units and maybe an inability to um, summate those action potentials to produce force. We also have recently found that there's changes in quadriceps torque complexity as measured by sample entropy. 
right? So torque complexity is basically establishing the predictability of a torque signal. You can use this with EMG or a bunch of different signal signals, but basically it looks at successive data points and sees the variability between those data points over a, uh, over a whole sample of data points. And basically what we found in the ACLR leg is that we have increased torque complexity um, compared to the control leg and that this changes over time. And that this uh, is thought to mean that there's more neural systems involved in creating the muscle contraction. And that the, the, the switching between maybe the neural, different neural systems or different parts of the brain and spinal cord in order to create a contraction may lead to uncoordinated movement um, and uncoordinated contractions. <clears throat> so we know that quadriceps weakness, inhibition, atrophy has been a problem for a long time. The question is why is it still a problem, okay? These folks are going through nine months of rehabilitation usually, if not sometimes six to nine months of rehabilitation. Um, Physical therapists, athletic trainers, rehab professionals are focused on restoring quadriceps function. They know it's a problem. I, I guess my point of view is that we spend a lot of time um, targeting strength and using traditional methods to target strength. So using concentric contractions, having them contract. But if we're not targeting the whole problem, considering the neural inhibition and the changes that are happening in the muscle as well, then we're not going to be able to solve the problem. Okay. So we need to consider neural inhibition or the AMI, okay? Because if we can't contract the muscle and we're trying to uh, improve strength through contraction only, we're going to fail, which is, I think, part of the problem that we're having. So we need to target both of these mechanisms. And we're going to talk about that a little bit here in a bit. I was also asked to talk about the biomechanical changes that happen after ACL injury. I can say that these results are a lot more consistent than some of the neural changes that we've seen. Um, I can say that there are consistently biomechanical asymmetries in patients that have an ACL uh, injury and an ACL reconstruction. And that rehabilitation is not, traditional rehabilitation is not solving these, at least at the time of return to activity. So this is again, just some data, um, data that came out of our lab, but it's pretty consistent with uh, um, a bunch of other data that's out in the literature. Um, whether it be hopping, so here in this study and what you're seeing from this graphic is a single-legged forward hop, but these results really um, would transcend to a crossover hop, a triple hop, they transcend to gait and to, run, to walking gait and to running gait. But what we'll see, at least at the knee, um, we'll see a reduced knee flexion angles. We also will see reduced internal knee extension moments in the ACL limb compared to a control limb as well as compared to a control group. We will also see changes in ground reaction forces after ACL reconstruction. So ground reaction force can be a, a, basically a surrogate for lower extremity loading. Um, in this study, we basically looked at ground reaction forces while we changed walking speed in ACL subjects as well as controls. So we had subjects walk at 100% of their self-selected speed then we had them walk at a faster speed or 120% of their self-selected speed. And we had them walk at a slower um, speed or 80% of their self-selected speed. For our control group, okay, which is this left graph down here, um, you will see no matter what speed they were walking at, okay, they were pretty symmetrical. So the dashed limb is the uninjured limb, okay, and the and the solid line is the injured limb. We designated an injured limb for controls, but none of them were really injured. Okay, so we see pretty symmetrical movement in controls with the vertical ground reaction force despite the speed. However, when we look at the ACLR group, okay, if we look at the, um, they're just their normal self-selected speed, which is here in blue, you can see that there's asymmetry. And this asymmetry is mag magnified when you increase the speed and it actually became less when you decrease the speed. So we don't know what the, the impl implications for that are, but just kind of thinking without studying it yet is that we might be able to reduce symmetries early after ACL reconstruction if we had them walk at slower speeds. And then once they achieve symmetry, that we make the tasks potentially more difficult. Some other biomechanical changes that we see um, after ACL injury and reconstruction, um, we've measured knee quasi stiffness, okay? And in, in 
To measure this, we basically calculated the slope of the regression line between early stance, which are the blue dots that you see here, and mid stance, which are these maze dots or yellow dots, and obtained um, by plotting the sagittal plane knee angle versus the moment curve. Okay. Um, and basically what we found is throughout stance, or at least throughout early and mid stance, that the ACL limb was always more stiff in the involved compared to the uninvolved limb. And this is something that we is consistent in osteoarthritis gait if, or patients with knee osteoarthritis. Um, it's also greater quasi knee stiffness has also been shown to be related to um, patellofemoral OA progression. Um, so it could be significant in terms of um, OA after ACL injury. So there's a host of biomechanical changes that we see after ACL injury and ACL reconstruction um, that need to be uh, tackled and handled throughout rehabilitation. So what are the relationship between the neuromuscular changes and the biomechanical changes that we see, okay? Pretty much all the time, we have muscle weakness and biomechanical changes that occur together, okay? The question is, are they related? Most studies will say that they are related in some way. Our, weak, our work basically shows that weakness usually accounts for about 25% of the variance in sagittal plane mechanics or changes in ground reaction force. Um, and I would say that's relatively consistent in the literature, somewhere between 20 to 30% um, of the variance is usually attributed um, by uh, weakness. So as a clinician, like why would, I, why would we care about these neuromuscular and biomechanical changes? So we have an injury, we have a surgery, um, we see these consequences such as bio, you know, changes in flexion angles and flexion moments, altered ground reaction forces, we have this muscle weakness, um, which we then know can lead to re-injury in OA if it's not tackled. Why are these things really important is number one, they're causing long-term problems. Number two is they should be modifiable. They're really great targets for intervention. Okay. It's really hard to prevent ACL injuries. There's a lot of data that shows that we can, but the, the numbers aren't going down even though they're a prevention program. So maybe we can prevent post-traumatic osteoarthritis by modifying some of these changes or at least prevent ACL re-injury. So I wanted to spend the last bit of my talk talking about some treatment approaches we have explored um, to improve outcomes after ACL reconstruction. So um, one one approach that we've taken is using therapies that target the mechanisms. And we're always about targeting these mechanisms. Cause like I told you before, I don't think we do a really good job of that. Now we throw some exercise at them and we want them to get better. Okay. We think that by using, by targeting neural inhibition early, and we, have been doing this by using neuromuscular electrical stimulation and by doing high intensity neuromuscular electrical stimulation. I think a lot of times in the clinics we're using neuromuscular electrical stimulation, but we're not using it right. Or we're not, do, we're not turning it up enough where it makes an effect, okay? So the great thing about NMES is that if the brain in the spinal cord is telling your muscle that it can't contract, NMES can by, bypass that because NMES exogenously activates the muscle. It's contracting whether the brain or spinal cord is telling us to contract or not. So it's not relying on voluntary contraction. So if we can get rid of the neural inhibition by using NMES, it kind of opens up more of the muscle to be contracted, okay? And so if we follow the NMES with eccentric exercise, which is known to be better than concentric exercise at restoring strength, we may have a better rehabilitation approach here, okay? And so we did just that. And we studied this in a really a pretty small sample, like eight to 10 um, subjects per group. We randomized them to get NMES and eccentrics, or we had them, we placed them in groups to get NMES and eccentrics, NMES only, eccentric only. We had a group that just went standard of care ACL rehabilitation at our, at our home institution. And then we studied a group of healthy controls that had no injuries at all, but didn't get any interventions at one time point so we could compare them. And we followed them, uh, we measured them before surgery, they gave them six weeks of these treatment, and then we measured them um, after surgery as well as at return to play or return to activity. Okay, so this is, whoop. So you can see here when we apply the NMES and we turn it on really high, it's contracting the muscle for us. So it's gonna override that inhibition in a number of ways to allow for contraction. 
And then our eccentric exercise intervention is basically a, a leg press. It's almost, it's like a game on the screen where we can set the concentric phase of the, uh, the leg press to a certain percent of the one rep max. And we can set the eccentric phase to another percent of the one rep max. So you can see that box there and there's a line maybe, I don't know how well you can see it in the screen, but that, that subject there is trying to place that line inside that box and train at a certain intensity for us. Um, so what did we find? We found that our neuromuscular e-stim and eccentric group, as well as our eccentric only group, were no different than healthy controls. We also saw that these folks improved more um, substantially over time, where the NMES only and standard of care were equivalent. Okay, so the yellow bars were different than all the blue bars. Okay, which suggests that maybe eccentric exercises was a driving factor behind the strength gains. But still, when you combine these things together, the strength was greater in that group. We also looked at eccentric exercise and neuromuscular stim in these same groups. We looked at their biomechanics. Okay. Um, statistically speaking, there were no differences between our healthy controls in terms of knee extension moment symmetry and knee flexion angle symmetry when compared to the NMES and eccentric only. That is not to say that I think clinically these folks are the same. You can see here that there is a lot of symmetry here between the healthy controls and there's still um, some asymmetry here in the neuromuscular e stem, but statistically they were not different. However, these groups are different from the healthies. So we thought that this was a good first study showing that NMES and eccentric exercise has some potential and eccentric exercise alone actually has some potential. I think some of the failures that we had in this study um, was to do with the NMES intensity. Okay? So there were some, this study was small, it wasn't randomized, there wasn't placebo control. So there were some limitations to what we can say with the data. But I think that from a clinical standpoint, one of the issues that we had is that um, the devices that we were using and the STEM protocols that we were using, even though we were following guidance um, based on the literature and what we knew, um, we couldn't turn the machines high enough to get the type of contraction that we had to get. So there's some data in OA and ACL patients where they use this machine called the MP300 PV. And this slide for some reason has not been working like I wanted to this morning. So I apologize. But if you look, the MP300 PV is able to generate a, a heck of a greater contraction. It's lifting her off the seat. It's generating a greater torque than the intellect legend, okay? This, Intellect legend is turned up as high as it can go in Russian mode, okay? Using the exact same parameters that were used within the MP300 PV, okay? I mean, so it's simple. Some of the machines just simply can't go high enough to generate a contraction that's large enough to reduce or, or to make changes in force. And so we had to actually spend a lot of time um, looking at different um, waveforms, et cetera, in order to get, uh, before we started this next study, I'm gonna to talk to you about in a minute, to get large enough contractions. This machine's not even made anymore, so you can't even get it, okay? So the literature that's showing NMES is effective is all using a machine that you can't get, so which isn't really helpful. This one's on the market and is very similar to many of the other ones on the market that use similar waveforms, et cetera. And so we think that that was a, a big part of it is that the waveform we were using and the, uh, the intensity that we're able to get or the amperage that we're able to generate is not enough. And if we could generate larger amperages, um, that we might be able to um, increase torque. So what we did is we found a machine that can do what we need it to do. And actually we're delivering it. We're doing a randomized controlled trial now that's funded by the NIH. And basically it's a single center randomized double blinded placebo controlled clinical trial where we're randomizing it over hundred patients into one of two study arms where they get NMES and ECC or eccentric exercise or uh, NMES placebo and eccentric placebo. Okay, and not only are we looking to see if it improves strength, activation, atrophy, um, biomechanical symmetry, we're also looking because there's some data to suggest that a weaker quadriceps is linked to post-traumatic osteoarthritis. We're also seeing if in our NMES and ECC group, which we expect to be stronger than the placebo group, if we can um, delay changes in cartilage health. So we're looking at T1 row and T2 relaxation times in the cartilage at around 18 months. So maybe I can come back and talk to you about that at another time because we're still ongoing 
but it, it's exciting for us. Um, another approach that we are looking at is something called functional resistance training. So if you take a look at the motor control literature, there's a lot of talk about task specific training. And when we talk about that, we're just thinking about repetitive practice of a task that is specific to an outcome. So performance improvements are gonna be greater when they're task specific and that's been shown in the literature. So if we wanna improve walking, we're gonna have them practice walking, okay? Um, if we do practice related training, it facilitates neuroplasticity and functional recovery and a variety of neurological conditions like stroke and spinal cord injury. So if we want to train, make the muscle stronger to improve gait biomechanics, then maybe we should do resistance training while folks are walking so that we can restore biomechanical, biomechanical symmetry. Okay. And so that's what we're doing. Um, and we just finished a study that looked at this and we call it functional resistance training. We do resistance training while the subjects are moving or while they're walking um, to see if we can restore symmetry and restore strength. So in this study, we use a custom designed bra brace, which has an eddy current attached to it, which we can provide re uh, resistance bi-directionally. So during flexion and extension, um, and we randomized subjects to one or two groups. So we had subjects who were um, scheduled for ACL reconstruction. Okay, They were randomized to either get uh, a, be in the brace condition or be in, a, uh, I guess, a placebo brace, but they're wearing a brace, but there's no resistance applied. And we measured them beforehand before they got the intervention. And then we delivered the intervention to them for about eight weeks. Um, and we measured them after and then about six months after. So after the eight weeks or after the intervention was over, as well as at the time of return to activity. And you can kind of see somebody over here um, walking with the brace um, and they're re receiving biofeedback at the same time regarding their knee and hip motion. And we have just two minutes uh, oh. before a hard stop. So you can wrap it up. Okay. Um, so we basically found that um, we found improvements in strength. Um, and they were greater at strength at return to activity. This is in one patient, but we just finished the results of it all and we saw improvements in strength in the FRT groups, okay? Uh, we also saw more symmetrical biomechanics. Um, and maybe I'll finish um, there. Sorry, that went longer than I expected. Okay, so I will end. Thank you very much, Dr. Palmieri Smith. That was amazing, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask if anyone had any questions, if they, um, if you mind, if they emailed you those questions. Um, that would be, I would be completely open to that. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, if you want to get one question and we might have time for one question. Oh, okay. Um, so I see a question here. It says blood flow restriction training has been shown to decrease um, disuse atrophy following ACL reconstruction, are you aware if blood flow restriction training also leads to changes in neurological inhibition? So yes, it does. Um, it, it has shown to change uh, neurological inhibition. It has, we did a study with blood flow restriction and we found it to be not effective, but we compared, we did high intensity training um, by itself compared to blood flow restriction with high intensity training. And we showed no difference between the two. But if you look at um, blood flow restriction with low intensity training versus just low intensity training alone, it has been shown to be effective at improving uh, neurological inhibition. All right. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. And for everyone in the participants, the link for the lunch is in the chat. Um, so um, use please use that link um, for the lunch. And the raffle. Um, is also in that link as well. So please don't miss the raffle and please be present for the raffle. Thank you.